Thank you, Ted, for the introduction and thank you for having me. Um, and everything you said is accurate. And I could only add that I am uh, just as of this year, I have joined University of Chichester, which is a small university in the south of England, as a tenure track professor, assistant professor of uh, European history. And there I am to teach also not just history of Russia, but also the history of China. And you cannot escape similarities and similar patterns in um, history of both, con both countries, as well as was the situation in Ukraine in history of Russia and history of Europe more generally. And with the current war, the topic couldn't be more pertinent. And um, I'm also here in Ukraine to visit my family. And uh, since the beginning of the war, we travel back and forth between England and Ukraine. And I'm in the posi position of privilege because I moved to England uh, almost 16 years ago uh, to pursue academic career for personal reasons. And now I do not find myself in a very precarious situation many of my compatriots, former colleagues and friends do when they have to leave their home country, not because they want to, but for various reasons, that stem from the current war that Russia is waging on Ukraine. And um, it also allowed me to bring my work um, closer and disseminate my findings to show how exploring history of Ukraine helps our understanding of the current war. And this forum is incredible for uh, as such an opportunity and um, I, I thank you all for coming to um, this meeting today. I would like to share my presentation with you and I will just share screen but um, if you could let me um, make me a co-host Ted if it, that's possible I would be able to. Yeah. I've just enabled screen share. Excellent. Perfect. Um, can you see the presentation, right? Yes. Perfect. So what do we know? What do we know about the Holodomor? Or what do we need to know about the Holodomor and why? And um, you also um kindly shared with me the list of questions that I would be great for me to cover. Um, and I'm sure many of you have come across, um, whether in your studies or in your interests, obviously, if you're here, you are interested in um, Soviet history, in, uh, car in current war and in history more generally, you have come across collectivization and you most likely heard um, the human suffering that it brought and facilitating of this policy. And um, many of you might have heard about um, the famine in Ukraine and this topic being politicized and contentious issue, how to interpret the famine in Ukraine during the old, old Soviet famine. So this is a brief outline of what I'm going to talk in the next 20 minutes. So, so I will first look into what is the Holodomor, what do we mean by that term, and how it was possible, how, who was involved, and why does it matter? Why does it matter for our understanding of the Soviet Union, its history, its collapse, and the current war? And if we place the Holodomor and the current war in the long durée of the of history of Ukraine, then we will see it as a, an episode in the metropole of trying to control its colony well before i don't know well before the nato was even conceived well before putin well before stalin we see it as a series of episodes when ukraine is denied its autonomy because of the center because of the empire because of the imperialist attempts to control places like ukraine when i'm asked about the analogy 
I am actually turning not to Hitler with the current war, but to the relationship between um, Great Britain as an empire and Ireland, its neighbor, that for a long period of time was united statehood, it's the repressions against its culture, language, national leaders, and there was uh, there were always the collaboration, the history of collaboration, and we will see in the um, we'll see in, inst in the instance of the Holodomor as well. Uh, some people do collaborate, and um, but that doesn't mean Ukraine doesn't exist. Neither does does it mean that Ireland doesn't exist. And um, of course, people are co-opted, and they in this imperial. Project. So what is the Holodomor? The term, the better term, Holodomor means death by hunger. Holod means death, uh, hunger, and more means death from hunger. So Holodomor, as a term, um, some historians trace it back to the 1930s. It was used in Czech media at the time. Others say this term was actually used um, by Ukrainians themselves, and there are different interpretations. But what we have today is that the famine in Ukraine um, that took place between 1932 and 33, the second half of 1932 and first half of 33, even though people kept dying in 1934 from conditions related to starvation, um, this famine in Ukraine, 1932-33, is referred as the famine within the famine, or Soviet famine, as um, the famine in the Holodomor. <laughs> Some historians also, um, and I tend to agree with them, say it's not just the famine, but it's also concurrent or simultaneous persecution of Ukrainian political and cultural elite, including intelligentsia, uh, political leaders uh, that were, le uh, well, uh, they, that were very active during the national movement in Ukraine following October Revolution and its um, fight for independent state in 1919, 1918, 1917. Um, so we're talking about um, the famine as part of the Holodomor and also persecution of Ukrainian intelligentsia and political elite, the clergy, including um, not necessarily just uh, Orthodox priests, but also Catholic priests, um, rabbi. Um, so I'm not necessarily, I haven't come across any studies about Muslim leaders, but all religious communities were affected by the Holodomor. And um, so why do we call this period within the all Soviet famine in Ukraine as a separate famine? A number of policies applied specifically against Ukraine with concurrent persecution of its intelligentsia at the same time um, makes this famine different from other from all Soviet famine, which affected many regions in um, the USSR, including Kazakhstan, where actually proportionally more people died of the famine in Ukraine. Uh, most uh, historians and demographers agree on the figure of 4 million, with the all Soviet famine claiming up to 8 million. In Kazakhstan, there are dif different estimates, and um, they also say that uh, national intelligence was persecuted. Uh, but what we have in Ukraine is that following collectivization during the first five-year plan, uh, we have already existing famine in 1931. Those years of hunger, as they were called by Stephen Whitcroft and Davis, um, that affected the whole of the USSR. There were shortages, people were starving, but yet a separate, very, not very, just unrealistic plan for grain procurement was um, imposed on Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic in summer 1932, which prompted many leaders in Republican leadership of Ukraine, as well as district level le le leaders, rank and file perpetrators of what was to come, to protest. Uh, about 40% of them expressed dismay and outward resistance to these uh, grain procurement plans at the party conference, third party conference, Communist Party of um, 
Bolshevik of Ukraine in Kharkiv in summer 1932, about 20% of district leaders said, it's not possible, we are not going to do that. There is already a famine. Yet, this grain procurement was adopted and um, because it was unrealistic, we see persecution, show trials of those leaders who did not want to go ahead. We see the sealing of the borders. Uh, we see, a f um, well, they were enforced in Ukraine earlier than anywhere else, than in lower Volga region, where German Autonomous Republic was based. Um, also, they sealed the borders as um, the victims of the famine were trying to escape it. And then we have different fines, blackboarding, which is effectively removing every means, every basic goods from the villages that failed grain procurement targets. So we are talking about removal of matches, salt, uh, kerosene or gas, they used to call it, um, closure of all trade and shops, and as well as turning them into ghetto, preventing the villages from living the villages. Um, then we also have transport restrictions in Ukraine. Um, in, so not only you cannot leave your village, in some cases you could, but to buy a train ticket, you had to have a passport. And villages um, or rural um, citizens of the USSR at the time were denied passport. In fact, they didn't get passport until under Brezhnev in um, 1970s. So in effect, you were denied the right to move for free movement, you were denied the right to cook your food because you were hiding it somewhere and hoarding grain and so on. So we have a number of policies, um, including fines, including reporting on each other or taking part in searches and being guaranteed 15% of what you can find, which turned this famine in a very macabre and very gruesome sight. And we uh, we have 4 million dying as a result, or 12% of the population of the Soviet Republic at the time. And um, more, more considerably more than in neighboring Belarus and Russian Federation where many Ukrainians were trying to escape. Um, so I included here terms just to revive what was happening before and the um, precursors of the famine. So it's collectivization. And um, we know how, what a tumultuous and very uh, the upheaval of the, that policy of uh, what effect it had on the countryside. Um, Kolhosp or Kolhos, collective farm, Kurukul, and um, we have industrious but or those who did not actually agree with these policies were branded as obviously enemies or kurkul, or they are called, were called wealthy. Kurkul, kulak means a fist, but really um, anybody could qualify. It was quite a porous term and many people were cast as um, kulaks or kurkuls. And there were three categories, some were executed, some were resettled within the districts where they lived and we have more than a million of people being deported uh, to the north and east of the country to Siberia. People who also, uh, when we are discussing collectivization, there is also the terms of 25,000 or plenipotentiaries, party plenipotentiaries, people who were sent from the cities to set up collective farms in the countryside. And um, they are mostly urban dwellers. Um, urbanites and many were actually volunteers in Ukraine we're talking about 7,000 people coming from Ukrainian cities but they were Russian speaking and many were many uh, peasants were perceiving them as uh, Russians but in terms of colonial or imperial interpretation of history they were coming from outposts of Russian empire right so Hence, uh, later, in, it would be remembered as the attack of Russia against Ukraine in cultural memory of the Holodomor. But of course, um, collectivization was met with resistance. And in 1930, we have an infamous or famous article uh, by Joseph Stalin on the 2nd of March. It was uh, published in Pravda, which was called Dizziness with Success or Dizzy with Success, in which he blamed 
um, the resistance to collectivization. And in Ukraine, we are talking about many acts of resistance, revolts, mutiny, um, uprising even, um, which reminded Stalin of 1919 and his um, close associates. Um, where many districts no longer had Soviet officials control in the situation. So uh, we have a situation in which Stalin had to act very quickly and very efficiently to establish, re-establish control over parts of Ukraine. And this is with success. And Ukraine was more, <laughs> there were more revolts against collectivization than anywhere else um, in, in uh, Soviet Union, about 40% of all revolts took place in Ukraine in 1930. So this article uh, was as a compromise in a way in which he blamed uh, the rank and file perpetrators of collectivization for all the excesses and all the um, um, twisting, he was calling it twisting of the party line. And indeed many people left, more than half of collective farmers left the collective farms, but um, later, half a, a year later, it was only renewed. There was a second wave of collectivization. It was obviously by force. In Ukraine, um, in 1930, there was a show trial over Ukrainian intelligence as well, and political elite. Um, so we can see that the fight on Ukraine, the war on Ukraine was really real. And um, during the uh, collectivization, the famine, uh, we have actually the famine, we have the chain of state-owned shops that were dealing supposedly with the foreigners um, trading, with the foreigners called Turksin. That's one of the last terms here. And during the famine, we see this, um, this chain of the shops in Ukraine procuring more gold from the population, desperate population that were taken uh, their family heirlooms to, in exchange for small quantities of food to survive, um, they were they procured more gold that was mined in the Soviet Union. And in fact, industrialization in the first half of the 1933 for the whole of the Soviet Union was sponsored by this gold being imported uh, exported um, rather than um, money uh, income from the export of grain. And that's the argument you see in the revisionist um, historians' um, works that um, they justify that indeed Soviet Union needed that grain from peasants and Ukrainian, including Ukrainian peasants, because it was to sponsor industrialization and sponsor um, the purchase of equipment needed for industrialization. And finally, there is another term I included, it's mounted tractor stations, uh, which means um, that uh, collective farms did not own tractors and other machinery and implements needed for tilling land. It was shared between motor tractor stations with, the, uh, they were serving several the stations with machinery, were serving agricultural machinery, um, several collective farms. And there was also, there were political departments within the stations that actually control and report the situation on the ground. So as I said, four million died in Ukraine as a result. Um, it was denied, the very fact of the famine was denied by the authorities until late 1987, when the first secretary of Ukrainian uh, Communist Bolshevik Party um, acknowledged that and said, yes, there were, there were shortages and there was a famine, but he failed to explain how it was possible. Um, and by now, 32 countries recognize the Holodomor as genocide. And um, and um, many actually um, recognized since the uh, February 19, uh, sorry, February <laughs> 2022, since the invasion started, it prompted many governments to take action on that. And the topic of the Holodomor and intentionality behind the famine, uh, there is a divide between Ukrainian and Russian historians, how to interpret the events. And we know that politics in Russia, current politics, and uh, for the last 10 years or so, um, under the leadership of Medinsky and Putin in particular, there is only one correct and accurate interpretation, and that is the official um, narrative that is obviously endorsed by the president and um, historical um, Russian historical society and Russian historical military society. 
And in that is that all regions of the Soviet Union suffered and it is a common shared tragedy. And there was no intention to um, obviously starve the population. It was just the difficulty of development. And sometimes the um, initiative for mass violence came from the local cadre, so along the lines that Stalin actually said in his um, article, as well as that um, um, Stalin and some revisionist historians, Sheila, Fat Sheila Fitzpatrick in particular, for example, says that Stalin was not informed on the situation on the ground. In fact, we now thanks to the open archives, know that he was actually very well informed as his um, email, not emails, sorry, telegrams and letters show and reports and how well he was informed and how he chose to pursue the policies that he knew would lead to the deaths of millions. And he's quite, even though there is no open smoking gun document saying that yes i the, i my name is stalin and i want to uh, ukrainians for ukrainians to starve um and so on we have letters between him and um republican uh, leadership we have letters between him and uh, his envoys in ukraine molotov and kaganovich in which they talk about ukrainians being taught a lesson um and the famine is that lesson um they talk about uh the risks of losing Ukraine and the necessity of turning it into a exemplary republic. How it was possible on the ground, and here I'd like um, to share just the policies that I already mentioned, um, the points, and here you can see the brigade that went from house to house in Odessa, actually, province. Now it's Mykolaiv province, by the time it was Odessa, and um, the brigade included people sent from the city as well as um, local people. Oh, wow. they were, yeah. Um, yeah, so um, they would go from house to house to um, remove food. Um, so here I'm describing just um, the searches and um, uh, the, uh, for example, um, fine that was imposed on those persons who didn't meet uh, the um, targets set on them. So their cows, their livestock would be taken as a result instead of the grain. And also, if you try to find food somewhere else in the fields and storehouses, there was a very conveniently passed law from the 7th of August 1932 for pilfering. So you would get a 10 year sentence for going into the fields and cutting, I don't know, thicklets of um, ears of wheat um, to mill them into uh, grain, uh, into, uh, sorry, uh, into flour to bake. I don't know. So commerce and food was banned, travel for peasants was severely restricted, and as I mentioned, blacklisting. And here you can see a brigade was already found sacks of uh, grain and other foodstuffs. Who was involved? And this leads to the question, my final conclusion, why it does matter. So institutionally, you have the state represented here very well. So you have the party and Soviet officials, such as the head of the village council, collective farm, and so on. Um, also trained perpetrators, um, those uh, enforcement bodies of the government, such as police, army, secret services. Party members were expected to participate in the searches or all other measures, restriction of the movement and so on, um, guarding the fields, teachers, collective farmers, Komsomol and pioneers, so youth organizations. Um, then another militarized youth organization, so are there him, also are there him in Russian. Many potentials in representing different institutions in the city, um, trade unions, um, in different educational uh, institutions, I'm talking about universities, colleges, workers from the factories, committees of non-wealthy peasants, uh, motor truck stations, and even prosecution was involved. And here, um, my research, for example, is based on the question as done by other researchers, because as well as my own interviews going to the archives in Ukraine, and even yesterday I went to one village that I'm using as a case study, uh, but on the Republican levels, on provincial levels, district levels, and what we have is that why people participated, even though it, there was already a famine, 
it's no different from other cases of mass violence and genocides in the world, because even though some did believe in the communist ideology and then they were changing the word for the better, the word, and they were building a new society. And indeed, it would be just parts of the very painful development. Most people participated for banal reasons and for many reasons at the time, at the same time could be. So apart from professionals, you have profiteers and careerists, people who were improving their financial state in, uh, uh, standing or um, advancing their career, or even getting something they wanted from their neighbors. Um, then you had um, obviously a fanatic, but they compile about 5% of the whole uh, cohort of profit um, perpetrators. And then you have sadists and criminals. Um, they are also 5%, but they are crucial in a way that they brutalize society. They do something most people wouldn't dare do, and, but they initiate them into violence. And then you have followers, uh, but that's the largest group, 65%, and compromised people, um, those uh, whose vulnerability is used against them. So if I don't go and search the house of my neighbor, my neighbor would come to mine and my children would starve. And when I'm talking about the Holodomor, we are talking about um, the uh, cause and effect removed in time. People don't die of um, starvation immediately. So you don't see the effect of your actions here and now. It's not as a genocide by a bullet. So uh, when you're removed from the effect of your actions, even though you know, you know if you remove food from people, they would die. Um, you are less likely to resist. You are le less likely not to conform. And most people do conform. 65% of us do. Um, and that's what happened in the Holodomor. Sometimes you would be asked to search or you would be asked to guard the storehouse. And as a result, you wouldn't be feeling guilty as you would otherwise. And why does it matter? My argument here is that for many, many reasons, reasons but it compromises the whole society. Why does the Holodomor matter? That, that <laughs> Ukraine, reason, just to let you know, you'd ask to be, uh, yeah. to let, you'd ask, it, it's been about, about 24, 25 minutes, but please take your time. Yeah, five minutes is exactly what I needed here. Um, so in case of Ukraine, we have interlink between national and social. And this is why it is important for our memory um, and memory in Ukraine and in Russia of this famine, simply because Ukrainian intelligentsia and political elite and civic society was attacked at the same time as the peasantry that provides for nationalism. And in Stalin's definition of the nation, it is the peasantry is that this nurture, nurturing environment for nationalism. And that was peasantry that fed that national movement in 1919 when the Bolsheviks were trying to establish its um, authority over Ukraine. And obviously they tried in 1918 as well, but unsuccessfully. And we know that Ukrainian peasants did not vote for Bolsheviks in um, the elections uh, following the February revolution in Russia. Um, so there was an election to, for constituent assembly in um, late 1917 after October revolution and early 1918. And we see Ukrainians in general voting for um, social revolutionaries and mostly for Ukrainian national parties. So you have, from the perspective of the Kremlin, you have to establish control somehow. You make a compromise with new economic policy. You make a compromise with indigenization policy or koronizatia when you offer cultural developments to non-Russian cultures. You support cultural development of non Russian republics. And what do you have in the end? From the Kremlin's perspective, you have um, this national movement only um, fomenting even more. And you have to wrap it up. And that's what happened in 1932. You have Karinizato and the indigenization campaign stopping abruptly, out, first outside um, 
Ukrainian Republic and then within in 1933 within Ukrainian Republic and also we have that in correspondence between Stalin and Republican leadership in Ukraine saying that our kulaks are different from the that of Russia because they had this moment of independence 10 years prior they talk about it openly and therefore we have applied special measures against them but also what we see in 1932-33 is that when Republican leaders, those who believed in the idea of communism and socialism, did express their concern about these unrealistic targets. By the way, they were lowered three times and never met. So there were no um, evidence to suggest that there were hordes, mythical hordes of grain, or Stalin believed that there were um, underground seas of grain hidden from the authorities. And so when they expressed that dissidents were the targets, they were removed from their positions. They were moved to Russian Federation, demoted, um, received some kinds of verbal warning or written warning, party warning, and, and there were show trials. Even though nobody, there was zero, 0.6% of officials who were arrested and tried for um, some excesses or avoiding what I would call mobilization today or enforcing this um, great procurement targets. Um, only 0.6 of those convicted um, or found guilty were executed. So it pales in comparison to the fate of the victims of the Holodomor. <clears throat> And so what we see after that, that all targets after the Holodomor were just leveraged down to the Ukrainian Republic after the Holodomor without even asking an opinion of the Republican leaders. So Ukraine was de facto, there was a direct rule from Moscow. Anything that was built or are all major projects um, since then, uh, it was to be confirmed by Moscow, not by Kharkiv or later Kiev after 1934. And what we also see, and this is important for our understanding why the Soviet Union collapsed, is that even though it was a modernization project, even though there were wonderful campaigns to eliminate illiteracy, vaccination campaigns, and um, the um, enlightenment campaigns, we see that the society you get, in effect, is a modern ancien regime where money decides nothing, where your connections decide your access to resources, where connections or blood or corruption pervades the society. Because simply to survive during the famine, you had to resort to survival strategies that go back in time, very primitive, but very effective in terms if you want to survive. And uh, we also see that Soviet agriculture becomes destroyed. It was devastated by the famine in many, many ways. And um, uh, yeah, it becomes very ineffective and it plagued um, Soviet Union until pretty much its demise, uh, demise or um, until it collapsed, because we, after the famine, right after the famine, you have shortages of hands on the ground. So you have students being mobilized to help with the harvest. And then throughout the 60s and 50s and 70s and even 80s, students were sent to the countryside to help with the harvest. Um, because simply as soon as collective farmers had the opportunity to leave the countryside. They did in the 1970s when they received passports. You are not paid anything, you are not motivated to work, and you are not motivated to start uh, to stay in the countryside. And obviously countryside, uh, agriculture was suffering from that. Um, and Holodomor also became, uh, those people who participated in the Holodomor uh, also became part of the system. And I will show that in this slide, which I still, I show it in uh, several presentations now, but right in the middle of this picture, you see a young man who was um, part of the collectivization activists in Russia proper. But then in 1932-33, he was um, indispensable in Ukraine, in Kamyansk, which is central Ukraine. That's Leonid Brezhnev. 
uh, he was in 1932 33 he became uh, he was um, um, in charge of trade union at Kaminske Metallurgy Institute and he was sent to uh, to the villages to procure grain to search the houses and he writes about that in his memoirs and how what resistance they were facing in the countryside and how it was justified he calls it a war as well in military terms as many other participants here he's on the right looking straight into camera and um other people that many um in the audience might uh, recognize if they looked into Soviet history of the time. It's Tahanovite workers or Tahanovites of the countryside. Pasha Angelina here in the picture, in the black and white picture, she's on the left standing uh, next to Stalin in a beret. Um, she's the first female tractor driver and on the left hand side of Stalin or in the, on the right, it's Maria Demchenko. She's another Tahanovite a collector farmer and finally Nadia Zahlada in um she well she's slightly older than uh, the girls who build careers and so on but in my work I actually come to conclusion she's a true believer and a worker so they became Stahanovites in the 1934-35 but um they most of them took part in collectivization and they write about that in um, their experience in uh, their memoirs in the 1970s, 1959, in case of Pasha Angelina, because she died quite early. But they also describe 1932-33 as the time of uh, shortages, food shortages, and how they were searching for grain and uh, how what hatred they faced in the villages and how they were blamed for the death of children that they say, oh, well, it was the work in the the exploits of kulaks so kulakos and there was one unlikely um perpetrator um who was um lev Koplev, who was um soviet dissident who migrated to the west and lived for the rest of his life in germany um, but who shows very little remorse for what he was involved in. And I went to the village where he worked. I worked in the archives of the secret services and people who worked alongside him. He was very economical with the truth. But the irony is that he started the forum of um, human rights forum in Germany in Bremen to about tolerance, morality, and humanity, whereas he did not see humans and Ukrainians. And here I'm drawing the parallels and uh, again emphasizing the imperial discourse here is that when he went to Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian countryside to work, even though he was brought up in a Ukrainian city, he could not associate himself and he was not empathetic at all with Ukrainian peasants who he saw means to providing food for people like him. Whereas when during the World War II, he saw human beings in uh, civilian Germans that were abused, um, the Soviet army advanced towards Berlin. And after that, he had troubles, but he also co cooperated with um, secret services. And um, in the end, he immigrated to the West, but he positions himself as the fighter with the regime, Soviet regime. And here I'm saying good Russian, even though some good Russians right now do not see um, the cause Ukrainians are fighting for. They're against the war, but they don't, they are not necessarily are for Ukraine. So, and hence I'd like to finish here that the Holodomor is important for our understanding in the res uh, in that respect that acknowledging that Ukrainians have a very specific, very unique experience of the Soviet empire, of Russian empire, is helping us to see this war as what it, I argue, is, actually is. So going back to historian von Ranke, history as it was, um, is, um, an attempt, another attempt in the series of attempts to control Ukraine, to make it part of um, greater Russian nation, um, greater Russian state. And existence of Ukraine 
threatens the existence of that great Russian state, even though Russia could be different, it could be a democratic country. It has a fantastic history of dissident movement, Sakharov for starters. Um, but um, at this moment of time, and unfortunately for Ukraine, uh, it still stays in the um, firmly in the territory of this imperialist thinking. And um, yes, um, understanding and exploring Ukrainian history helps um, to see that as such. And on that, I would like to finish. And um, I would like to welcome any, um, yeah, any um, questions you have. So I will stop sharing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Daria, for that uh, very comprehensive review of the Holodomor. And so if anybody has any comments or questions, please go ahead. Uh, Ted, I see your hand up. Go ahead, Ted. Oh, I, I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm not gonna ask them all. The most important one that I am interested in is the intentionality of Stalin in this case. And Stalin and the Stalinist regime. And if you can ex talk about that a little bit more, but also give us some sources to help us use in debating the current apologists for Putin. Because this is an issue. I posted the, the announcement of this on the Marxism list, which I'm a moderator of. And we got 40 posts, mostly throwing garbage at the announcement. Mm -hmm. But the most intelligent garbage was thrown by people who buy the line of unintentionality. So I would like to be able to counter that with good historical sources. The other question I have, which is wildly different, but is related to your comparison of Ukraine and Ireland, which I think is a great and perfect historical comparison. And I think, and I would like your comment on this, the Holodomar is a very close analogy in the 20th century to the potato famine in the 19th century. That's it. Thank you. Oh, I think this one, oh, thank you for the question. And I'm sorry that um, there was a negative reaction to the announcement. Dor I Dor think this if, if we could, maybe we'll take a few comments and questions and then you can go ahead and if, if you don't mind. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Thanks. So we've got Cheryl, Nina, and then I've got a question and then and then maybe uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Daria, for that presentation. Um, <clears throat> my first sort of exposure to understanding about the Holodomar was seeing the film Mr. Jones about six months ago, which if people have heard of it, I um, was a Ukrainian, I think, British collaboration. But um, it was a very powerful experience for me. I'm sorry, <laughs> just thinking about it really moves me. Um, that has stayed with me ever since. Um, and one of the aspects of it that has stayed with me, of course, was the story of um, the, the opportunists, particularly the journalists um, who were making their careers on hiding the facts of the Holodomar. And they wanted to present the Soviet Union in a particular light and they didn't want, and it was, as you said in your presentation, that this is just a necessary evil for, for the higher goal of creating this new, this new system that will ultimately free everybody. And that is something that I think all of us who consider ourselves socialists and just radicals who want to change society have to really think about very, very carefully. Um, so I, I'm interested in any comments you, you might have about the accuracy of that film based on your presentation. I think it was pretty accurate. Um, I'm 
also, I'm, I, I'm just learning about um, the specific history about the Ukrainian revolution and the Ukrainian, I mean, with, within the Soviet, um, that Ukraine had its own, its own particular socialist movement that goes way back in time. And I know that's a separate topic, but it is related to this because as you said, there was a certain percentage of um, Ukrainian socialists who were Bolsheviks who said, you know what, we don't support this. And as a result, they were either, you know, they were put on trial, they were executed, they were sent to Siberia, et cetera. So um, I have more to say, but I just wanted to make those comments um, initially that uh, um, I hope none of us will ever be any of those who, who justify something as horrifying a genocide as this for a higher cause. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Nina? Um, so, um, uh, it's hard for me to formulate this clearly, but I, um, I let's see, it's, it has to do with the question of intentionality. For me, um, and I'm definitely not a historian, but I, I have started to see the Soviet Union as uh, an extension of the Russian empire. In other words, the Russian empire in, in a new guise or a new development, rather than saying it the other way around that, um, you know, so it was a Russian, even though Stalin was not ethnically Russian, Nevertheless, it seems to have been a Russian movement. And anyway, that's, I can't make it more clear. Please make what I'm saying more clear. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, some reason my hand got lowered by the computer or Putin or somebody. Um, so I have one brief comment and, and, and then a question. And, my comment, when you talk about the true believers, Daria, and we see that today, you know what it made me think of was um, cults like the, yeah, I don't know if you're, for, you, you know, like uh, Jonestown and Jim, jo Jim Jones and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And if you would comment a little bit about the psychology uh, of, of the true believers. The other, my question is, to how, how would you explain how the experience of the Holodomor affects the consciousness and the politics in Ukraine today? Mm -hmm. So with that, uh, Simon, and then maybe Daria, you can uh, respond to the questions and comments. Mm -hmm. I'll be very brief, uh, very like two short questions and one comment on this. Um, the questions are actually about uh, your field of work. If, if for a simple no is okay if you if you're just uh, not not interested in this topic, but uh, Holodomor is um, it, it includes just the Ukrainian experience, but not just in the sense that it was in the Ukrainian SSR, but also in the Kuban region. So, did you have any uh, research on on that? Because there is a for those who don't know, there was a large. And there is still a large majority of uh, Ukrainians in, in the region, which is today's Russia. And uh, the second one is also because I'm Polish, so um, I would um, tell it later. But the question is, um, with your work, did you come across, uh, there is a lot of, about this in Polish historiography, um, about people trying to escape uh, to the what is Today, the, uh, Western Ukraine, but it was part of the uh, the Second Polish Republic at, at at the time of Holodomor. So that's that's my question. And the comments. It might be interesting for you guys to 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 know more about what's happening on this uh, on Holodomor in the countries of the region. Um, so I would just say a few words. What change? What did the world change um, in the Polish perspectives about the Holodomor? Because we didn't talk extensively about the whole issue in Polish historiography in general, as you probably may know, the, probably the Volin massacre or the, uh, or the action Vistula, which was in today's mm -hmm. Poland, but um, it, 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 it did contain the situation about Ukrainians and Lemko people. But um, it did change after the war. I, I, I still feel, uh, feel that way. 
there's so um, in, in popular culture there's so many books uh, uh, from Ukrainian authors so obviously also about uh, I mean popular literature I don't mean the the the, 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 the researchers but just just popular popular literature which is showing the whole the more uh, in a more belletristic way uh, there's a lot of this in, in Poland now uh, there's a lot of talk about there was a lot of talk about Mr. Jones which is uh, to Cheryl it's a Pol it's a Ukrainian uh, British Polish film um, and also um, an Applebaum obviously because she 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 is um, she's American but she lives in Poland her her, her uh, husband is Polish and well, and well known actually so um, I do feel that um, that many things have changed of course there is still you know there's a lot of popular anti-Ukrainian sentiment in Polish society there's this colonial discourse still, because it's not just Russian colonial discourse towards Ukraine, it's also the Polish colonial discourse towards Ukraine. We should remember that. But um, I'm not more optimistic, but I feel that the Holodomor is something that is more widely known in my country now because of the war. I don't know if it's a good way of saying this, but, but, but this how it is. Yeah, so that's all I have. Sorry for taking too long. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Daria, please. Yeah, I will actually start with the last question and go back retrospectively. So thank you for your question, uh, Shimon. I was um, Anna Palbaum's uh, research assistant for her book, um, The Red Famine, and I know it was almost immediately translated into Polish. And um, um, both her and her husband, um, Radoslav Sikorski, are great friends of Ukraine. So. I think they are changing that colonial and challenging that colonial discourse existing in Poland. But I'm really not surprised, but I'm really pleased that the Holodomor entered the cultural texts um, in Poland. Now there is interest in that topic. And uh, yeah, obviously for the wrong reasons, uh, the war, now this interest is there because of the war. But um, yes, Anna Pavan was one of the first, and because she's Polish, uh, she's a dual citizen, um, both American and Polish, and she speaks Polish uh, quite fluently. Um, I think her contribution to disseminating of this topic is, um, especially as a, a historian and journalist, is incredible. But um, yes, about Kuban, of course, and we can see that attack on Kubani, on Ukrainians living in Kubani, Ukrainian Cossacks, was simultaneous with the Holodomor. And the whole Stanitsa, so the whole settlements in Kubani were moved to the north of Russia, um, Poltavska in particular, 25,000 people were moved, children, the elderly were moved um, to north. And uh, they were just uh, replaced with um, population with from Russia proper. So while there were Ukrainians still living in Kubani after the Holodomor, uh, their numbers were significantly lowered by the Holodomor. And in the correspondence between Stalin and his envoys in Kubani uh, at the time, I think a Molotov went, um, they were discussing how they even have to re remove memory of Cossacks from the settlements that they are a raisin saying, oh, there is a cenotaph to the fallen Cossacks in uh, Russia Turkish wars made of marble. Why it's still there? It's 10 years after the October Revolution, and we still have memory of another state there, of another struggle, of imperialist wars. So, yes, of course, I would include Kuban in the Holodomor, and many historians of the Holodomor do, including Roman Serbin, Olga Andreevsky, um, they talk about it not only within the borders of Ukrainian Republic, and the borders are important because they were sealed later on, but also about Kuban and how the whole educational institutions with English, oh, sorry, Ukrainian as a language of instructions. Um, there was, uh, for example, teacher's college that were, they were teaching um, teachers of um, Ukrainian language and literature in Kuban. Um, it, it was called pedagogical училище. It was immediately closed down in 1932. So we see that um, an attack on Ukrainianness. So social and national link is there. 
I hope I answered your questions. Um, then about, John, your questions about um, psychology of the perpetrators and, and how it affects um, um, Ukrainian politics today. It does affect. I think it affects in many ways. Uh, first, um, that corruption was uh, very much encouraged to thrive in the Soviet society and it still plagues Ukrainian politics today. Um, it, it is about whom you know. It's not about um, rule of law. It's actually rule by law. And so you can pass whatever suits your political agenda, just like Stalin did with his restrictions of people finding food in the fields. Or you can pass whatever suits your personal interests. And it also removes um, agency from Ukraine. And in many ways, you see Yanukovych, you see Kuchma agreeing his policies with Russia in more than just being diplomatic. It's getting guidance from Russia because you don't think of your country as an independent and sovereign nation. You still think in terms of this imperial discourse. And Shimon, you're right about Polish uh, discourse, but I think in Poland it's changing. I can't see Russians changing their discourse in the foreseeable future unless they are militarily defeated as um, Polish um, did. Of course, um, there are re there is resistance to that in many parts of society. But also about psychology of the true believers. <sighs> okay, so as I was tackling this true believers one by one in my case studies, and that's what the book is about, I actually struggled to find true believers until the last one, this Nadia Zahla, this old lady from Shatome province, and I could see that she had troubles reconciling ideology with understanding that actually what Stalin was building was not at all a socialism. And it's related to Nina's um, question about um, empire. He was building an autocratic state and he was very flexible with ideology as well. And we can see that in many um, testimonies on Stalin, people who knew him personally, but also uh, Marxists and socialists, when they point out where he actually diverged from socialist ideology. And I think these perpetrators uh, who were true believers, um, like Nadia Zahlada, um, they struggled. And that's why they saw what this society was built in 1960s during this Thor period um, under Khrushchev. She wrote an article uh, to a well-read tabloid uh, magazine uh, called Aganyok, which I would compare to people in the United States, or hello in Great Britain, in which she questioned the collective farms that they built, um, that people do not care about them, they are not motivated. What, where did we go wrong? And then she also, it was allowed to criticize Stalin just a little bit, so she said, in the 1930s, when we were building collective farms, and she refers to the famine, obviously, she says that we were after the targets and we forgot about people and we lost a lot. And our collective farmers, uh, our collective farms still haven't recovered from them. So she actually, essentially, she said how disastrous that collectivization in, in Stalin's interpretation was, and for Soviet Union in particular. So I think they did struggle. And if they were not destroyed by the uh, repressions of the late 1930s, uh, they found themselves facing a very grim reality. And I think that's where, like Zahlade, they realized what they built was not socialism. Um, and I agree with Nina that it didn't matter your ethnic group as much as, uh, obviously, unless you were Chechen or Crimean Tatar, then you would be deported. But if you were collaborating with the regime if you were Ukrainian and you as long as you were not claiming that Ukrainians had the right for a sovereign country as long as you were part of the Soviet project I think um, of a larger project I think you were part of, of that empire you could exist if you were political Ukrainian and you have uh, Mykola Khvalyovy and um, many others who were different ethnic background claiming they were Ukrainians in the 1930s. So you have a nascent political Ukrainian nation. And certainly today we see a political Ukrainian nation, regardless of 
uh, your ethnic background and sometimes even the language you speak, you have, this is where Stalin had a problem with. And even though he actually, his definition of a nation include ethnic element, I think he was building an empire and um, he was building an empire, not a socialist state. And in that way, yes, there is a title nationality of Russian and it's above everyone else, just like um, English were in the British Empire and there were politi famous British politicians who said, oh, I never understood those funny Irish, well, no, I always found Irish strange. They never wanted to be English. And that's the answer to uh, the question about Ukrainians. As long as they are calling themselves Russian, they're fine. So I agree with you about the question about Mr. Jones. And thank you, Cheryl, for that question. Yes, I think it is very accurate from my understanding of what um, the whole, uh, what the experience was and other testimonies and um, witness uh, testimonies and what I I work, worked with his um, um, uh, Ray Gamash and um, other bi biographers of Gareth Jones. I think it's very accurate film. Also, there was a question about uh, Ukrainians crossing the border into uh, Poland. Um, there are currently several scholars working on the subject and um, they're investigating how many people actually crossed successfully, how many people were stopped at the border because there were marches even into Polish to the border, to then border between um, Second Polish um, Republic and Soviet Union. And um, of course, uh, there were also um, different organizations within Poland at the time trying to help um, the starving. And there were, Poland tried to help as much as it could under political circumstances. And um, ob obviously, Robert Kushnitz, um, uh, his research is indispensable on that topic. Yes, and finally, um, yes, and Cheryl, yes, thank you for highlighting the um, similarity between now and then, the opportunities that are built in their career for various reasons. So there are useful leaders, so to speak, sorry for that term, but also those people who actually um, advance that, who believe Russia would win, who believe that ultimately business would go back to usual and countries, even though right now they're supporting Ukraine, money will win. And therefore Ukrainians are not uh, those, uh, they're not actors, they're not subjects. Um, but it leads also to the question of inter intentionality. And um, I will send here um, the link to the letter between, uh, actually, it's a telegram to St from Stalin in which he actually covers. Uh, okay, there is no, as I said, smoking gun documents, but we it's circumstantial evidence that we can infer his intentions from, and it's one the closest you can get to smoking gun reference, and that's if you click on that. Um, click on that link, it would take you to English translation of his telegram, but also his reaction, because he was well informed. And if you confront those um, comments, you can say, why Stalin did not react if he was well informed of people dying? After all, I mean, if you accept his epistemological authority, when he says industrialization is there to build a defense um, and to protect Soviet citizens to help others, why in the same time you're killing millions? So isn't it the whole goal of industrialization to protect people, not to kill them? So is it your right to kill your own people because they're resources, because they're a colony and to accept that they will die? Uh, so it kind of defies the purpose. The other, um, Quite important argument is that they didn't ask for famine relief, international famine relief, like they did in 1921 when Stalin did it, when he, uh, through Gorky, Russian famous writer, to all honest people of the world to help the, star um, the starving of Russia, primarily in Volga region, but there were south of Ukraine affected at the time too. And that's following intervention, foreign intervention in 1919 by Antanta. 
So Britain, France, yeah, so they invaded Russia in 1919, and yet in 1921, you are asking them to help. So if they say, well, there was a war scare and Soviet Union would not allow anyone to enter the country with the international relief, uh, famine relief, you would say, well, in 1921, they did, and following intervention. And here, not only didn't they ask for international relief, they refused to acknowledge that the famine existed, just uh, sentencing people to death and uh, denying and covering and even persecuting Jones, uh, Mr. Jones, under very suspicious circumstances. He was a certain native in outer Mongolia and Manchuria in very shortly after that, after he's exposing um, the lies. So you can say <laughs> the, all modern famines are man-made in a way that there is an opportunity to help. You can stop export of grain, and the Soviet Union did not do that in 1933. You can redistribute the resources within the country or sell works of art like they did in 1921 to generate more revenue, to buy grain that was available from Persia at the time, but they didn't do that. In fact, there were orders against Ukraine to starve people, to remove salt and matches from them. This is not about grain. Surely when you take away their dried food, dried fruit, for example, or prevent them from milling by removing hand mills from them. So it, it's, it was clearly about using that for political gains. And yes, there are these telegrams and there are letters from Stalin uh, to Molotov, Kaganovich and Kosior. Um, in which they discuss it as, um, and uh, this Holodomor dot UK um, uh, is indispensable in um, uh, pro uh, providing English translation of these documents, Holodomor CA, sorry, not UK, CA. Um, this is Holodomor Research and Education Consortium, and they helped my research and they helped research are currently sponsoring funding, supporting research of other um, scholars who look into the Holodomor. I hope I answered all questions. Sorry, it took so long. Thank, thank you, Daria. So we have Andy and then Linda. You're on, you have to unmute. I think so. Okay, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's been very interesting. Um, learned quite a bit. My basic question is this. One part of the history that I, I don't understand is how it ended. And we talk about the terrible famine and the more and more of 1931, 32, maybe 33. How did it end? Why did it, why did it end? What actions were taken to end it? And on that, I actually have a personal connection. And I'll tell it, try to tell it briefly. My grandmother migrated from Belarus in 1907 to New York City at age 17. In 1934, when Roosevelt gave diplomatic recognition to the Soviet Union, Americans were allowed to travel back. She traveled back to Belarus, took a boat to to Odessa from New York City and then took a train and visited her family. And she came back for a few months and then came back to New York. One thing she brought back with her was a photograph of her holding loaves of bread in 1934. And if you give me um, the ability to share the screen, I'll show the photo. And, but the basic question is she's showing that the hunger is over. And my question is, how did it end? And if you'll give me permission, I'll share the screen. I'll show you the photo of her. Screen sharing is turned on for everybody. So I think you should be able to. Can you share? Can you see it now? Yes. OK, well, that's my grandma holding loaves of bread in 1934 in Belarus, uh, where she was visiting her parents before she returned to New York City. And she's holding the bread as though they're children. She's trying to make a statement, I believe, the hunger is over. So my question is, 
what ended it. Thanks so much for your talk. Thank you. And um, there was another question from Linda. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, were, were, were there any other uses um, by Stalin or the Soviet Union of mass starvation as a political tool? In fact, I mean, I mean we've heard that, that, I mean, the apologists for Russia always say, well, you know, there was starvation everywhere, like in Kazakhstan and, and you know, places like that. And, you know, Ukraine is just trying to make itself be special. You know, I mean, I, I have to listen to these people all the time in this country. It's just terrible. But, um, I mean, that's the sort of thing they say. And I'm just wondering, you know, it, it seems like they really had it in for, for Ukraine, but they let other, but maybe let other places starve too, but didn't um, actively try and, you know, increase the body count. I mean, did they, did they do anything like they did in Ukraine anywhere else? And, and actually at any other time? Andy, can you turn off the screen share, please? I'm I'm having difficulty turning it on. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um. So I will start with Andy's uh, question about uh, how did it end, and as um, I did mention that people still died in 1934, even though food was available and. Uh, not as obviously it wasn't lavish or there was plenty of food but um, it ended actually with the policies adopted for the harvest 1933 these policies uh, were adopted in if I'm not mistaken January or February 1933 but they didn't take effect and Take, uh, they didn't take effect until later in the year. I'm talking about August 1933. And that's when we can actually say the famine stopped. Acute famine stopped. Because people died, as many as witnesses say, as flies still in June and July 1933. First reason is that there was a new harvest. You are less likely to find food in the winter. 1932-33 um, for obvious reasons because there is snow there is nothing left in the woods and people in steppe regions or prairies I would call them regions in south Ukraine had even less uh, opportunity to do so or even to fish or hunt and in winter your opportunities are limited but so there was a new harvest but the crucial policy was that instead of grain procurement targets now it was a the harvest was taxed. So no matter how, how big your, the harvest is, there is not a number of, um, in terms of tons or foods at the time, um, it would be taken away from the harvest, no matter the size of the harvest. There would be a percentage taken of the harvest and the rest would be left in the collective farms. It would be, um, collective farms would have to pay motor tractor stations and there would be something to keep and distribute it between the collective farmers. And that arguably ended the famine because uh, there was tax in the year of grain procurement. But also what is, I would argue was very crucial is that in 1934-35, collective farms were allowed to keep vegetable patches for individual use. And those vegetable patches, and it's incredible this fact, provided, I, I came across different figures, but uh, they all about more than half the fruit and veg consumed by the consumers in, in the USSR until its collapse. So more than half of the produce, agricultural produce, apart from the grain, obviously, but fruit and veg on the tables of ordinary Soviet citizens were produced by the collective farmers on their individual private plots. And we are talking about very small plots, um, 40 um, sotak, sotka, which is one. Uh, so it's, I would say, an acre, but I'm, I might be <laughs> trying to convert it. But, uh, so it's a hectare of half no half an hectare of land that they used for to till after their work at the collective farms they would come home and they were motivated to work hard because they could sell it at the collective farm markets 
and they could feed themselves ultimately and they could make some profit out of it and feed their families and close buy clothes and what not so um first it's the change of the policies um legislative acts um the second is this um um vegetable plots individual uh farming well it's not farming actually it's uh, i don't know vegetable plots uh, it's not industrial farming but at least um the policies changed and um yeah those two major ones that's how it ended and the second question was about um the um ukrainian uh, specific unique ukrainian uh, and um inflated numbers indeed in the recent years, uh, since 2010, there were attempts to inflate the numbers, and there are different agents of, I would call, actors uh, in Ukraine and outside Ukraine in Ukrainian diaspora, who argue that there were 7 million, and then they inflated it to 10.5, and now they're saying even more, and they, these numbers are not based on um, demographic demographers research um they are not saying there is no peer review of such claims uh, they are not published in any peer-reviewed um uh, journals and i would caution uh against using them because uh, in annabel Baum and other historians um that received peer-reviewed reviews uh, they are using four million and um, in fact demographers reconsidered this number again there was first four, and uh, they did calculations there were different teams of demographers international teams uh, ukrainian demographers and the difference between them came to uh, one and a half thousand victims so it's very close to four million and uh, based on the uh, census in 1926 regardless of where people died and there were different obviously um, testimonies and mentions of how many people died and estimates and contemporary estimates but if you have a number of people uh, living in, in ukraine in 1926 there is a certain number of uh, women of uh, childbearing age that could give birth and based on the previous fertility rates and in Ukraine demographers do use formulas that are internationally recognized and they projected the number of people um, who were to live in Ukraine in 1932-33 and then it affected how many obviously the famine how many people uh, how many women had children and how many people survived during this period and then you have census of 1937-39 and it all confirmed so four million and I know of this um, attempts to inflate it doesn't do a lot of more studies or Ukraine or the politics any favors and um, as a result um, it gives uh, grounds for Russian historians to say well look, they can't even agree between themselves uh, on the numbers and they're talking about unique Ukrainian experience. But uh, on that account, you can argue that, yes, everybody starved, but in 1932-33, the starvation in Ukraine was actually extreme. And that prompted Ukrainians to cross the borders into Russian Federation. And Russian district officials were complaining to Moscow and to Ukrainian Republic, Republican leaders that what's happening in your country and in Belarus as well. Um, there were reports from Belarusian officials saying, we always used to go to Ukraine for bread. And now your peasants are so... Um, they look so drab and so depressed and so de in despair and crossing and send just uh, um, spreading panic among our collective farmers about the famine what's happening in ukraine and um, we have thousands of ukrainians being detained at the border between russian federation and ukrainian socialist soviet republic um, and put in filtration camps we have eight thousand of ukrainians uh, sent back and there are figures so there are archival uh, documents showing that situation in ukraine was far worse and if we are talking about russia proper we have two percent dying of that starvation in that period in 1932-33 in Ukraine, we have 12.5% dying during the same period. And the areas in Ukraine affected 
that were affected the worst were those who actually in 1919 showed more resistance to Bolshevik rule. So it was not per se to do with grain production, it was, uh, was the loyalty to the Soviet project. Thank you. Okay. So I, I would like to make one, uh, one comment and then I see Stanley has his hand up. And my comment is in relation to the, um, the relationship being made between what happened to the, between the relationship between Ukraine and the Russia Soviet Union and Ireland and Britain and like mm -hmm. the potato famine and the Holodomor. And I, I agree that there are, you know, some great similarities, but here's where I, I feel that there's also a difference. And that is in, when I was in, I was in Ukraine a little bit over a year ago. And the impression that I had from talking to people, including comrades in Sociální Ruk, is that the 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 feelings of national rights and the the uh, um, anger at the at Russian imperialism is very mixed, very much mixed up with equating Russian imperialism with socialism, which is what the Soviet Union, um, you know, claimed to be. And therefore, well, opposition to Russian domination tends to be very mixed up with opposition to socialism. Whereas in Ireland, it's quite different. And the history of rebellion against British imperialism, if you take, for instance, James Connolly and, and Larkin, is just the opposite. That the hatred of, a, of imperialist domination is very much mixed with the hatred of capitalism. And the opposition to imperialist domination is very much combined with socialism. So it seems to me that there's also that difference and you know maybe Daria would want to comment on that when we get through with these points um Stanley uh, two things one <clears throat> uh, Daria mentioned that uh, there was proof that uh, Stalin uh, was intentional and in what he was doing I think the language was something like wanted to teach Ukrainians a lesson and the link that was put in the uh, chat, I don't think says that. Uh, maybe it's a different link. That, that's okay. number one. Um, number two, to bring this stuff up to date, um, I think it's so important that, uh, that the, the left talk about the Holodomor to understand Ukraine and to understand how uh, in the 40s, there was support for reactionary nationalists like Bandera and, uh, and how that continues today as, uh, you know, a, a natural uh, reaction to this mass murder. So they're going to, you know, anybody who's going to oppose it, jump on that ba bandwagon. And uh, they didn't see uh, uh, Marxists, Leninists, and so on. Uh, do it so they would go for these other people. I'm done. Okay, thank you, Stanley Ted. Yeah. Ted? Ted, you are muted. I am not now. Thank you. Dara, you talked about the extension of the famine outside of Ukraine, but can you talk more about Kazakhstan? Because I think that's a very important issue that we, even though it's not your specialty, it's relate closely related. Yes, um, yes. So I will um, start with the question on Ireland and Ukraine comparison. I couldn't agree more. And I think this is a crucial difference between two comparisons. Was there, there is no very accurate and clear-cut analogy, historical analogy, and 
that you can apply from case to case. But in terms of Ukraine and Ireland, I couldn't agree more that that's the difference. When came comes to um, empire and na uh, domination of a nation, then it is quite similar. But yes, indeed, because it was uh, Brit British Empire was capitalist and Ireland, um, yeah, here, here lies the difference. Um, then there was a um, question about um, intentionality. Yes, I am looking to find that in English. I have seen that memorandum between, um, from Kosovo to Stalin uh, dated 15th of March 1933, in which they, um, as if in dialogue with Stalin, he is talking about um, the famine being a lesson to teach Ukraine's uh, peasants a lesson. Uh, so, as means, sorry, as means, was a means in teaching Ukraine's. So, I will try to find that. Um, then there was a question about. Oh, okay. Um, I think it could be, yes, um, David Marbles, but yes. Yes, it could be here. I was uh, just trying to find the document itself. Yes. Also, I would recommend uh, the work uh, by Andrea Graziosi, who also um, Graziosi, um, in one of his articles, um, he talks about how the Holodomor helps us to understand the Soviet Union and its history and the Soviet project. And he dispels the myth of the Soviet project. Well, he is talking about it not being a modernization uh, project per se. Then there is a really important point about Holodomor surfacing in Nazi propaganda and Bandera as well. It, it's immediate, it's impossible to escape it. And in fact, many critics of um, Anna Pilbaum's book uh, wrote about it, that um, she admits it, she doesn't explore it in, in uh, depths it deserves. I would say on that account that, okay, so we have famine denial in the Soviet Union. You cannot mourn your debt. There is not a cross even at the mass graves. And for 10 years, almost 10 years, you are denied that right. Of course, it would be used by the Soviet Union's enemy. In this case, it is Nazi Germany. And uh, from current research, we know that most countries, including Spain even, through um, communist inform bureaus, were actually informed of the famine in Ukraine. Nobody chose to act upon it because Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union and many uh, countries actually looked forward to recognizing um, Russia, oh, sorry, Soviet Union at the time um, and establishing and diplomatic relations. So uh, Ukraine was ignored. There was no support to the starving in Ukraine. And yes, of course, in 1941, as soon as um, Nazis came, uh, there were attempts, grassroots attempts to commemorate the dead. And it was immediately jumped on by um, Nazi propaganda and it was used, Judeo-Bolshevism myth was used widely and anti-Semitic tropes were used in Nazi propaganda. So it was the Jews who starved the Ukrainians and so on. It was used widely, widely in Nazi propaganda. And Ukrainian nationalists, including um, some writers like Olas Samchuk, um, they used it in their novels even you can see um and then later in diaspora you see that trope anti-semitic trope repeated over and over again and of course it's it was started in 1942 but there were also attempts uh despite a lot of more being used in Nazi propaganda attempts to estimate um, the number of victims in particular districts um and quite accurate ones, actually. In one district, they estimated 11.5 thousand victims from the famine. So 
it continues to plague the memory of Ukraine and haunt the memory of Ukraine because um, during this in Soviet propaganda, then um, the Holodomor was accused of being a figment of Nazi propaganda and Nazi imagination because Nazis used that and the first commemorations of the Holodomor took place uh, in Ukraine under Nazi occupation. So some mass graves were marked and so on. Um, so that tarnished the memory um, of the Holodomor by exemplary Soviet citizens. I mean, in Soviet cultural milieu, it was food shortages. And if it was Holodomor or attack against Ukraine, then it was Nazi propaganda. And still we see that resurfacing in the reviews of Anna Pulban's book. That, that they say, and that goes along this Soviet propaganda and now Russian propaganda. So we see that being politicized for all the wrong reasons. Um, and um, about attack um, on Cossacks. There are two researchers known to me that are looking into that. And there is one good monograph dedicated to the subject. And there are some documentaries, films, actually filmed 1992, 1993, when Cossacks in Kobani were interviewed. Um, so it's not as well as research as the famine in Ukrainian Soviet Republic, but um, there is research on that subject as well. And of course, um, anyone who was questioning the Soviet project um, were deemed as enemies and Cossacks presented a great problem just like Ukrainians did and Ukrainian Cossacks in particular. Um, yeah, uh, thank you Stanley for sharing this. Uh, encyclopedia of Ukraine, yeah. Okay, thank you, Daria. So we've been going on now for almost an hour and three quarters. I see Bradley has his hand up and maybe after Bradley, if Daria has any final few words to sum up and then we can end the meeting. So go ahead, please, Bradley. Yeah, I'd also suggest uh, perhaps Mike Davis's late Victorian Holocaust um, in terms of drawing analogies between the uh, Holomador and other such, you know, colonial slash accumulation type events. Uh, in fact, it probably makes a, a better historical analogy given that all analogies are partial by definition. Because in India, as well as in China, Davis makes it clear that this that the mass famines in which millions and millions of people died under British colonialism in those countries was quite deliberate. It was the result of a deliberate British imperial colonial policy. So um, in the modern era, as opposed to Ireland, this is the last thing I have to say, which of which the potato famine was the end of a long period of what was called the Protestant uh, supremacy in that country, more closely connected up with the primitive accumulation of capital in that period, which gave rise to the capital's mode of production in Britain. Um, so again, Mike Davis's late Victorian Holocaust would be perhaps an even better analogy with the hole in the door. That's it. All right, thank you, Bradley. So, Gary, if you have any kind of a final message that you'd like to send to us and elsewhere. Um, I would like um, just to share one more um, collection of documents uh, from the same website of uh, Holodomor Research and Education Center. Um, there are documents about uh, proven intentionality. Um, I would like to finish concluding thoughts um, on intentionality, to be honest. I think politicians are responsible for the policies they pursue, whether the outcomes are intentional or not. And not to admit the un even if the famine was unintentional, 
outcome of grain procurement campaign in Ukraine 1933 to deny famine relief to Ukraine. There was very little famine relief actually in April 1933. And even then, you don't call it a relief because it's um, it's the grain that was taken away from the same peasants. So when you not only deny the outcomes of your policy, but you actually persecute those who expose the lies, I think it tells you something about the leader and something about their intentions. And given the precedent of asking for famine relief in the past and not acting upon the famine now, it it just tells you more about the Soviet project as such. And um, it tells you a lot about current war as well, because I think what is happening was a awful for Ukraine, but also awful for Russian citizens too, because they are treated as resources. And uh, this is what capitalism in Russia is about currently. Now it's not a socialist project, and it is pursuing exactly the same aims. It was a, very similar means of war of attrition, destroying and destroying now their own citizens uh, at the same time. So it's very anti-Russian and it turned all countries anti-Russian. So they achieved the masses, but that ultimately like Stalin and like his predecessors, it seems that they don't care about people and um, yeah, I don't want to finish on pessimistic um, note. My concluding remark is that about you, that you have interest in the history of Ukraine and you actually explore and research. And I think because there is support for Ukraine, Ukraine will prevail. And I always hope for the change in the future and um, that eventually society will improve. And let's hope that this war will be not for nothing and Ukraine will prevail. Thank you.